news. Um, has anyone got any news or questions for the club? Have a have a question, Daz. Yeah. Hi guys. Um, about Hello. to do a um, my first uh, small batch brew, ten litre. It's going to be brewing a bag. Never done brewing a bag uh, before. I've punched some figures into um, uh, Beer Father, Brew Father, whatever it's called, and they're suggesting about uh, 15, nearly 16 litres of mash water. I wouldn't have thought I needed that to add that all at once, um, but uh, maybe do the first mash at two and a half um, times and then add the rest later. What do you experts on brewing a bag think? What do you recommend? What do you advise? Paul, oh, don't worry about it. Chuck it all in. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, Paul, what you might, might want to do is, uh, or it's, it's usually full volume mash. Yeah, and you, we, we, it tends to be brewing a bag. Yeah. So don't worry about that. And it's going to be thin, all that type of stuff. You might expect to see a loss of efficiency as well, which tends to be the case with brewing a bag. Uh, from those who are used to doing it by other means, like a three vessel type jobby. Keep, you might want to keep back a little bit though for rinsing the grain if you're able to, if you're able to get the grain out and then just just give it a, a final rinse. So part of the water for that. Yeah. But, but Mark, Mark, Mark th that's almost to, to sparge it. You know, kind of you're it's almost not, no, not, doing not, it's not sparging it. It's, I, I don't well. You know <laughs> what I mean. The rinse of sparge. You, you you are not. You, you're just giving it that final going over to get the, uh, the the sugar that is still coating the grain. Uh, yeah, yeah, when, when you yeah. are lifting it out, so yeah, you're yeah, not trying right. to extract I'm, I'm the water out of it. I'm not just speaking uh, just speaking the purpose, but if we're talking about you know like you know a, a full on Bruner bag. Uh, chuck all your water in. Take your grain out. Let, let it drain. You're sorted. You know, one of the beauty of the, of the of the method is you don't have to keep some water back, you don't have to rinse it, etc. It it takes so so much less effort. Hmm. Um. All, all, I, I don't know. Have you, have you got any space restriction for getting that amount of water in your vessel in the first place, or um, have you, have you got loads of room to be able to put the full volume in in the first I, instance? Yeah, I, I I probably have. Um. Oh, yeah, but, well, um, there you go then. Yeah, keep it simple. What, I, what I'm thinking is, is obviously I, I still need to have the target um, temperature, 67 in this case. Um, will the, I'm sorry, I haven't seen the strike temperature recommended. I can't find it for the moment. But it's going to be vastly different, isn't it? It's going to be a lot lower than I would normally use uh, for mm -hmm. strike. What do you mean, Paul? Sorry? The strike temperature, the, the water that goes into the grain, it's normally about 72 ah, seconds. Ah, right, yeah, because yeah, you've got a large volume. Yeah, yeah large volume. You might want to be three or four degrees higher than your mass temperature. If, right. if, if that. If, if that, that, yeah, it depends how warm your grain is as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Paul, um, um, Brie Father would, 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 uh, would give you the answer. Usually plus or minus. Uh, on a like a, you know a standard sort of um, 18 litre batch that I do it's about four kilos of grain and say yeah. 25 litres of water plus minus and uh, the temperature is, uh, is uh, above my mash is only by about a degree and a half so what I actually do with an all-in-one unit I just hit, uh, I hit the water to my mash temperature in the first place chuck in the grain and warm it up some more okay yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Got that. So these figures are correct. Then it's what I'm basically what I'm doing is doing my first um, uh, pressure ferment in a, in a ten litre corny keg. Um, so I guess this next question is for Steve. Should I uh, just put the pressure fermenter anywhere, or do do I need to keep the temperature up, or doesn't it matter? It's it's a lager. I've I've only ever done them at normal room temperature so like 20 21 degrees so keep them ambient <clears throat> yeah that's kind of the the joy of it really is yeah you can just pressure ferment at room temperature um and i put a spunding valve on for about 15 psi one bar that's it yeah just let it go really i haven't fiddled with it at all really and i put it on at 
15 psi right from the beginning as well. So dump it into the fermenter, put the lid on, put the gas it to 15 psi, spunding valve on, and just take a few samples as it goes along. And it's getting a deacetyl rest all the way through because it's, it it it's at 20 degrees. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. And then do you get any foam through the... Um... I think Jacques asked this last time. I can't remember what uh, what was said. Do you get any foam through the spunding valve? Um, I haven't done it in a corny. Um, I I you can get depends on headspace. Yeah, doesn't it? And, yeah, and also depends pressure on will will keep the, the uh, well. foam down. Um, if you're doing ten liters in a twenty liter corny, is that no, right? No, it's in a ten liter corny. Ten liter corny. Yeah. Um, on the the fermenter source, I get a Krause and two inches max, really. Um, What's the volume? On a normal volume, so twenty three liters. Um, we'll offer a lager um, with uh, double the amount of yeast, um, and it normally does. It'll normally be done in a week. Yeah. Five days. But yeah, the pressure keeps the Krausen down is essentially the idea. Um, so yeah, maybe put eight or nine litres in or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. I suppose the thing with the spunding valve is if you can get hold of a check valve, not a checker zirking one, but um, one that obviously stops the liquid gun gunging, gunking up your... Um, Spunding valve. Uh, <laughs> I've made that mistake before, um, but it, yeah, it could, it, it could get out. But um, I don't know. You'll probably you'll probably be all right with like eight or nine liters, I guess. And, okay, I think I'm, I'm, I was thinking it was the, uh, the the pressure. I'm actually using um, this corny, which is a um, a Chinese sort of thing, and it takes about so uh, it's it's. Uh, Marked down as a 10 litre, but it probably takes about 12 or 13. So there's going to be quite a bit of headspace in there. So I'm hoping that, combined with the pressure, will keep yeah. this thing under control. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, good. Lovely. Thank you. No, not at all. Good luck. It's, it's been a revelation, the whole <laughs> pressure fermenting lug, I swear to God, because it's just, it's ester free. And then you can obviously do a pressure transfer and to. Ideal for those who haven't got cooling yeah sufficient to take it down to uh, uh, four degrees or zero degrees yeah it's such a nice way to be able to do it honestly i love it perfect thank you yeah that's the second downside of the uh, of the grain father fermenter it, it's not it's not pressurated uh, yeah the first downside is the <laughs> the valve but that's fixable at least uh, you have to pay a lot of money for conicals that'll take um, dispense keg levels of pressure. Yeah. I, find, I find just the dispense kegs are cheap enough. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And I just say, you can you'll... get what second hand, 50, 60 quid? Uh, you know, well, if you're going to go for a Sankey, but you know, you can get corny kegs quite cheap, and yeah. it's just, you know. My my plan to go with pressure fermenting is to still do some beers in my conical that need some yeast character, but they're getting out of them straight away, and I'm going to transfer them into kegs to actually clarify them. Um, so so I'll be doing two experiments. I'll be doing regular pitches of characterful yeast, and then some pressure fermenting for running beers. See how that works. Oh, sorry. Are you doing pressure fermenting with ales as well, Richard? Well, that's the plan, but obviously for the kind of ales that don't need a lot of character. Um, so... You lose they, the esters, don't you? You lose them. Um, so my approach will be to doing the stuff I don't care about the esters, pressure fermented, and they'll be kind of a continuous production, nearly nearly a commercial kind of setup in terms of methodology 
or still following some of the same mythologies when um, when I'm using the actual conical because it can't chill it. There will be characterful be characterful yeast going into it, but they won't stay in it very long. So they'll actually be coming out into kegs and maybe doing secondary in there. Maybe conditioning that, that way as well, like if you transfer them before they're complete. So here's to hoping I can actually uh, get my brewery up and running without temperature control using both pressure fermenting and you know character yeasts. Which I, was, I was going to try that this week as well, actually, Rich, with um, pale ale, just normal hoppy pale ale with USO5. So almost no yeast character required as it were for one of those so yeah. just malt and hops um because I've, I've i've had a bit of trouble retaining the hoppiness of the pale ale that i'm trying to do um doing it in the normal plastic fermenter and just doing a kind of gravity transfer so i yeah. wanted to try the same with the fermentosaurus thing as i've been had quite a good success with the lager. I just wanted to try a non-ester pale ale, so it's all hoppy and mul um, hoppy, hoppy and malty, and no no yeast character in it. So I was going to try that this week actually as well. But I was going to try instead of doing um, fifteen psi like you do for a lager to keep the esters really really down. I was going to maybe do sort of three or five, if that, so that it suppresses most of the esters, but maybe with a characterful yeast you might still get some yeast character coming through if you do it at low psi maybe two or three or something like that even i i mean i don't know you're gonna be experimenting you, yeah. with that i guess yeah you can fiddle with it obviously start sure, with trust, sure. trustworthy yeasts yeah and be conscious of your pitching temperature and um, some yeasts will be a lot more tolerant and some of these won't I've, I've kind of i've gone with the rule of thumb of um, one and a half psi equates to sort of a one degree centigrade drop in temperature. If you see what I mean. Mm. So, putting putting fifteen psi on a lager at room temperature of twenty degrees is equivalent ish. Different method, but it's equivalent to maybe fermenting at ten degrees. So I've kind of gone with that as a rule of thumb for, yeah. say, for if you were to do a bitter, for example, then maybe you want to ferment it at 18. Something like that. Um, the advantage of obviously fermenting under pressure is you know, bugs get in, no oxygen gets in, yeah. um, and then you can do an oxygen free transfer afterwards and retain the flavor, really, and the aroma. Well, you can so, serve straight out. Yeah. And you can serve it straight out of the thing as well. So yeah, um, I guess things like saisons probably wouldn't work, and Belgians probably wouldn't work because they're all ester-driven. But the stuff like lagers, which are hard enough to do, um, I found it a pretty reliable way of doing it. Yeah, I'll try it with a pale ale as well this week. Because so. I heard a few guys, a few, a few of you guys, uh, talking about. You know, a floating device that floats in the keg. So rather draw it from the bottom, it draws from the mm. top. Yeah. So if you if you ferment in a keg with that device already in there, and then just pressurize it in in addition and 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 serve from it, then yeah, okay, you're still going to get maybe a bit of gunk in that first pint, but then the rest is going to be absolutely okay, right? It should be as long as it's. So then why would you long. ever ferment your lagers not in a keg? Uh, <clears throat> start winning some yeah. lager competitions <laughs> uh, with that method. I don't know. Um, it, it makes you wonder, well, we've got the um, Lager Than Life coming up again, haven't we? I, I suppose. Uh, mm -hmm. Early next year, hopefully. Yep, I'm sure I'm that quite a few people will be, trying, will be trying it out. Uh, it would be useful to know those who use that method, I suppose, somehow. Not for the judges, um, but uh, some means of working it out afterwards to see how they, they fare. I did on the first Lager Than Life. I got a forty-three with the oh, Czech Pils done, brilliant. done under yeah. pressure, and, and a German one pulled like forty. 
something like that. And, and I think what have you done then? It's mainly it's because it's ester free and it's off flavor free. The method that's the kind of the biggest gift I kind of get from it, and then the oxygen free transfer. So you get a good recipe, and then it's your methodology or your kind of process is so much improved by just doing it under pressure that all of those all of those kind of hurdles that you have with the lager mm -hmm. keeping it at the right temperature keeping you know all the esters out all that kind of thing is is kind of almost like magically solved <laughs> in a way it's a slightly easy way of doing it um and i do wonder whether my my big question about it is though um if you ferment um, cold, as it were, 10 degrees, the yeast works slowly and in, in one physical way. But if you put it under pressure, it kind of it seems to have the same effect, but it feels like it's a physically different process. So you're squashing the yeast. It's, all, it's the only way I can describe it. It feels like you're treating them like a caged chicken or something. Do you know what I mean? It feels like you're treating them badly. Animal cruelty. I, that's what I mean, right? It feels wrong. Um, I, can't, I can't believe I'm hearing this. <laughs> the, the thing that made me think of it was um, once I've kegged um, out of the fermentosaurus and there's a little bit of like beer left on the top of the yeast cake, sometimes I'll dump something straight on the top. But of course, you have to let all the pressure out first before you can take the lid off and when I take the all the pressure out the whole thing bubbles up and I get this terrible guilt that I've given them the bends or something like that do you know what I mean so all their insides burst out I why don't you pressure why don't you pressure transfer into the uh, keg Steve yeah no I do do that but when I when I then want to you reuse that yeast cake. They have to take the lid off to dump the new wort in it. Can't you? Can't you pressure transfer the wort oh, into I see. the? Um, mm -hmm. It's coming out of the kettle, which is kind of unpressured. That's a good point. Yeah, but, but if you put it uh, put it from a kettle into a corner, pressure as the corner, and yeah, corny yeah. is absorbed. Ooh, look at that! Yeah, I could do, and it might save giving the yeast the bends. And <laughs> sleep soundly at night. You've then. got to save yourself some consciousness there. I kept <laughs> you might say. crawling under the front door, coming to get me. You might save your fermenter too. Yes. <laughs> and your security deposit or house insurance. <laughs> but, um, anyway, that's my only worry, and I'll, I'll be investigating that, and I'll report back. Because what, what I think I, I did mention last meeting, what I plan to do is when I when I get the brew in a bag um, procedure uh, and the um, pressure fermenting uh, procedure uh, well under control, um, I want to do a, a 20 litre batch, split it into two 10 litres, ferment one under pressure, ferment the other normally at uh, cold temperatures and then do a, a blind tasting. Hopefully can, by the time I do it, we'll be meeting again and we'll be able to do a club tasting of it. But that's the plan. Cool. And Paul, uh, one thing I did notice when I went to um, full volume mashing, uh, on the same recipes, I get a little bit less of malt character. I don't, I, I don't know why it's, it's I, I don't have any empirical evidence to support it, but um, yeah, so um, that's just an observation. Okay, so what I've done is taken a um, recipe here from Jamil, it's one of his uh, recipes, and I've scaled it down by half. So you're suggesting I should maybe add a little bit more malt? We'll bring the ABV in, up a little bit. Yeah, so, so I, I, I mean, um, what kind of full volume machine allows me to do is use a little more of those extra character for malt. So for example, you know, like that's called special B. You know, I can easily use 3% with the full volume, whereas before that would have been too much. I, 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 as I say, I don't, I don't have any uh, evidence to support it. I don't, I haven't done any side by sides, etc. But it feels like, you know, when I made the switch to full volume, and I'm not looking back for sure, that, um, you know, it just allows me to 
up my recipes a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. But like, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend you go with what you would do normally and judge for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At this stage, it's not about necessarily about, uh, you know, the, the, those special malts. It's just about the, the, the procedure. Um, have I got it right? And when I come to do the 20 litre batch and split them, is there a difference in flavour between um, pressure fermented and uh, traditional traditional fermentation methods? Just curiosity. Um, and, and if that's the case, then if, if there is no difference or and if there is no discernible difference, why do we go down the traditional methods and uh, have long, cold fermentations? Yeah. Well, I'm, I've, I've never done a lager in the traditional, traditional way. I've done the quick, uh, you know, the quick lager method. It's pretty decent. Okay. You know, it does end up pretty much at room temperature at the end of it. And then I bottle yeah. it at room temperature. I don't even call crash. I, I call crash after carbonation, the actual bottles. Yeah. No, really looking forward to trying that method. I'll report back. Yeah, I think we're all looking forward to the results. Yeah, I think one thing to mention about this is your pressure fermenting will control the ester, will, it, will bring the ester suppression aspect of a genuine lager style. But, you know, you if you're going down the route of actual lagering, that also introduces extra character, which... I don't believe pressure fermenting is going to do anything for us. So, I mean, if you you're going to have an unlagered lager that's fermented well to get that to really get the excellent stuff out of it, you probably need an extended lagering period, which for me is going to involve just putting it into the kegerator and ignoring it for a while. But uh, that's what I found, Rich. Yeah, yeah. You're right. it, the the pressure fermentation only takes the place of the 10 degree fermentation method and once you're fermented you still need to lager for a month or two because then it does do the proper lagering lovely taste and it gets into its stride in like two months or something like that and that lagering can take place in the bottle or in the keg yeah just at the low temperature i mean i've yeah. i stick it in a keg and stick it in the fridge but, for two, um, for two, de a two degrees does because um, you know, uh, when you bulk age a beer, it do it does one hundred percent happen quicker than if you you know bottled it up and then aged it. You know, okay. Yeah, the, the pick up pick your Belgians for example. So for a lager, is it um, just the lagering aspect of it? Are you keeping it at the cold temperature that that allows that clean, crisp flavor to shine through? or there is also an aspect of aging that happens that contributes to that? And which one is higher if it is? I think some, it'd be worth talking to somebody technical in a brewery, but I think most of them would say that the chemistry that happens at very cold temperatures is, well, one, very complex, and be therefore very important. And it's the aging aspects, which is, what we'd normally associate with, say, a barley wine that you leave out for a couple of years, those kind of processes are much, much slower. So I, I think the lager character is more due to, like, really cold lagering temperatures. And this seems to be borne out anecdotally by some homebrewers who can do this, who can, like, lager at 0 0.5 C for, like, two months, that the character comes out that way. Um, that temperature will slow down any traditional aging chemistry. Yeah, that's the question I guess. Yeah. yeah. So th that's my opinion. Again, not backed up by science, just more by opinions I've read and some anecdotes I've seen. Yeah, I know I've found the same thing, that it's, it becomes a proper lager after the proper lagering, as it were. Well, interesting. Um, it's nice and fresh at the beginning, and, and it's got a really nice, mm -hmm. keller, hazy feel to it. And the flavour is all there and it's fresh and everything, but the nice, super clear, rounded lager comes with your traditional eight weeks of lagering. And I'm going to just say at this point, has anyone tried the Bayerbrook stuff? I'm about to open one of them. That's one of their killers. And they brew it traditionally. They're British lager guys. They did a 
collab with Don Zoko and Lost and Grounded, I think, a while ago. Um, so I wanted to try some of their stuff. And they, I think they got in a German brewer and they do it all properly and decoction. It's really, excuse my French, it's really fucking great. So nice. Really, really good. Done the proper way. But then they're professional professionals with super amazing ingredients and everything like that. Um, but you know, we can get close. I've got one mind side by side, and it's like, well, it's not exactly there, but it's of course we're it's not bad. Um, I, I, I think I um, highly I, recommend I, those guys. Don't, really. don't curse me if I say it, but I think you know <laughs> what I've seen in the, in the home brewing scene uh, over the past couple of years, and you know, competitions and whatnot. I think an average home brew is actually above an average commercial bit. Well, I, we'd all agree. <laughs> no, no, no I'm, I'm like, you know, kind of taking emotions out of it. I genuinely believe that. Yeah. And like a couple of friends who I brought over to, um, you know, to, to the tasting part of competitions, they were absolutely gobsmacked. First of all, by the choice, you know, by, by the variety of things that they haven't even considered possible. And yeah. second of all, by actually the taste and they really, really enjoyed the beers and they were like, I can't buy this at the pub. Because we give a shit, Serge, is why. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I think my dinner is burning. <laughs> You're decocting your dinner. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I scorched it. Mm -hmm. oh dear. Can I ask a question about dry hopping? Go for it. Because it's my and it's only the second or third time I've done it. Um, the first time I did it, I chucked them in the demijohn, which is obviously a, a complete the nightmare to get them out again. So I made that mistake. Um, and the second time, I've just chucked them in half, like a, a week into the primary fermentation, and chucked them in a bag on top. And it's obviously it's killed all the krausen. I'll show you. I'll show you it. Um, i will just going to turn my video around. I'm not sure if it's just about to die or not. So they're floating because they're wet hops. But I don't know, I'm worried it's all gone wrong. Does anyone basically, what, what do you do if you dry hop it? I generally only ever use pellets for dry hopping, so. And certainly wouldn't use wet hops for dry hopping either. You won't get any, mm. you'd hardly get any character unless you have a whole load which will then act like a sponge and suck up most of your beer. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I think that's the mistake I'm making. It's just sitting on top of like a, you store like a whole bag of. Yeah, if you're gonna, yeah, if you're going to use whole hops, you've definitely got to weigh them down. Um, you could use like a bag of marbles. Glass, glass oh, marbles. Yeah, that's what I did. I put some marbles in, but I did not expect them to be so floaty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I put like, all the marbles I had in, but they're still floating. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, don't don't use wet hops for dry hopping. Um, yeah. And if you are using, say, pellets, what do you do? When do you when do you put them in? Uh, when the beer's done. Yeah. Basically, in the, in the primary. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. In the primary. Yeah. yeah. Wait, wait for fermentation to basically be done then just dump them all in. Um, the other thing that you want to do is agitation. Um, you want to give them a good stir every day or maybe mm. even a couple of times a day if you want to get it really to zing. I, um, I would avoid doing anything like that just yeah. simply because, yeah. you, well, any danger of oxygen ingress is, is well, yeah, going to kill that. that. I mean, th this has got like uh, 180 grams in a, um, for 18 litres of dry hopping. Um, and uh, that was literally just dumped it, when when the the we hit when I hit final gravity, dropped it down to like twelve thirteen degrees, um, and then literally I done the, the ferment as close as I could and literally just opened the lid, threw them in, shut it down as quick as I could to avoid any uh, avoid as much oxygen ingress as possible, um, and uh, yeah, and then and then left it a couple of days crashed it down further and then kegged it from there. So that's what I would recommend doing. I mean, how, how long do you leave your dry hops on the, on the beer then? Couple well, of days. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I gather sort of 72 hours, but it's done pretty quickly, I gather. Yeah. So a lot of people yeah. say something like three days uh, and it's done. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's the whole thing about chucking the hops in any earlier. You've then got to have a means of getting them out because if they sit on the beer too long, so that dry hop, double dry hopping or triple dry hopping, I think you've got a problem there of being able to get them out. Um, yeah. I mean, well, I mean you, can, you can put them in at the beginning of fermentation, people do. Uh, I think I, I, I tend to find a lot of the, the lovely sort of hoppiness ends up getting off gassed with the fermentation. Yeah. I wondered about that. And yeah. the, the, the whole idea of like biotransformation, I think it, it exists, but it's a real sort of difficult one to find. It's almost a bit of a mythical beast. Um, and I think it seems like most breweries now that do this sort of thing are going towards just do it at terminal gravity. Um, yeah. because you're unlikely to say introduce any um, it, it hops. Can you end, can end up with a hop creep where the beer restarts fermentation very slightly? Uh, oh, I've, um, got, I've got one of those. Um, I've got an ice spindle and three pilots. Mm -hmm. And on that, when you dry hop, you get a sudden, what looks like a massive drop in um, gravity. It sort of goes down to sort of 10 or whatever. Um, and that's just the increased fermentation which goes on by chucking in sort of six ounces of dry hops. Yeah, uh, I, the, really, one problem it, I, the one problem I've, the one problem I found with, event. yeah, I mean, the one problem I found with that is you end up with a bunch of diastole in the beer. Um, I, I've, had a few even commercial beers. Magic Rock used to have like their beer was like loads of diastole in it. They seem to have sorted that problem out now. But um, yeah, uh, so I would always like wait until terminal gravity and then dry hop. A couple of days, get it off the hops. But ideally, if you can chill, that's ideal because the, hop, the you can then put all the pellets in loose, and when you chill it, it they all drop out. Yeah, I've got the means to of cold fermenting of, of cold crashing and yeah. i can i have sometimes have a carboy just with a couple of liters in and that the you could actually almost see them drop out as the temperature goes down yeah yeah the the the, the hops at the top yeah just go straight to the bottom that helped yeah no that's brilliant thank you thanks guys um any other questions so yeah, can I ask a quick question about, excuse me for turning my camera off, I'm eating my dinner, um, about temperature control. So I'm still brewing in a bucket and really I'm trying to gauge it when it's going to be hot enough that it's going to be okay. Talk to me about sort of equipment that's good for temperature control. I live in a one bedroom flat. That's probably quite important. Um, you know, what, what's good, what's bad? What would people recommend? Uh... Well, good. Obviously, if, if you've got a spare fridge, but space probably is an issue. Um, yeah, you can shove a fermenter in a, in a fridge and put a temp temperature controller on the fridge. Um, that's what I've done for the last five or six years. Um, if you want total ghetto system, you can get a um, uh, basically a builder's truck from like B&Q or any garden center and just put water in it and put your fermenter bucket in that and that will stabilize the temperature quite nicely. Um, yeah, it depends on how high tech you want to go or how basic. Um, or, it, or if your flat is not, uh, not too uh, warm, let it go ambient as long as it doesn't go um, above about 24 degrees. Um, that should be okay. What you won't be able to do is, is replicability because with control comes replicability. So if you're not worried about that, then, uh, um, and these are ales, presumably, you won't, you won't, you won't get yeah, any yeah, the there's, bar. There's no yeah. um, just go with it at ambient to start with and, and, and see what happens. Yeah. So uh, from about now, isn't it, till about May, you're kind of okay if you're, you know, yeah. you're not going to be winning prizes or anything with an ale? Yeah. Well, I've, I've got a really, really cheap solution and a not so cheap solution. The cheap solution that I employed for a couple of years, actually, is um, to have um, six, six bottles of um, 
15% saline solution, six two liter bottles, frozen in the fridge. And then I, all I would do is take a um, sleeping bag, wrap it around my fermenter, and stick four bottles around the corners. And I would swap two of them in the morning and two of them in the evening. And that allowed me to ferment at about 16 degrees, no problem whatsoever. Yeah, I'll obviously fluctuates, etc. But yeah, that's about 16 degrees. I, um, the expensive method is um, what I do at the moment is um, I got a grandfather conical, which is basically a jacketed fermenter. And all I do is pump cold water you know, through, through that jacket. And um, I use exactly the same bottles of 15% uh, saline solution and, and, and swap them, um, you know, in, in the summer months, say um, I swap stuff just three times a day, you know, in the morning, in the evening, and before I go to sleep, you know, at the moment, you know, once every two days, etc. cetera. Um, and like, yeah, fermented lagers at 12 degrees, no problem doing that. And that, that keeps the space because the only extra part that you have to have to your fermenter in the cheap version is just a little extra space around it. And that would get you 16 degrees or so. Um, you know, in the expensive, you need to get me a jacketed uh, fermenter. Uh, additional space is just like a, a little cooler, minus 12 liters. That's the job. Alternatively, you could go with a Kavik yeast. And I don't think um, they're so, those yeast are so fussy about the temperatures, are they, guys? Don't, don't yeah, then you might have to warm it up. I was right. going to say the problem there is that there's some of them are you know they go at thirty and plus um, to get a diff the, the real Norwegian character out of them or, or whatever the character that some people go for. And a heating spray. Um, they a will. They they will ferment perfectly well at sort of in mid twenties, upper twenties, and so on. So um, that's that's that worth a try. Yeah. Even with two heating belts, I found it hard to keep a fermenter at 30. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I, I just pitch it at 35C and it works, the, the Kvike yeast would work so quickly that it'd be done before it had the temperature, the chance to drop. So if I'm trying to get Kvike character out of it, that's yeah. the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. That's awesome. Thanks. No worries. Anyone else? Silence is good. Cool. Um, <coughs> the only thing I've read actually, yeah, does is about wet hops, because I was looking at it um, last year, um, in that uh, it's just about how much of the wet hops you use. Um, so look at the stack, because it's 80% water before it dries out. You need something like four to six times as much by weight to yeah. give it the same impact, whether it's bitterness or flavor. So it's just a matter of, yeah, using loads more. So you can use wet hops, you just gotta use loads more. And all that beer you're gonna lose, that's the only thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also like, so there's wet hops around here where I, there's just hops around in the season now. I picked what I thought was a load and I came back and it was only 200 grams. Well, but I divide that by five, it's not much. So uh, it's basically a kilo of hops is what I want for my next brew is bloody -ish. it's like massive backpack full. <laughs> it makes you realize how cheap, cheap hops are when you buy them. So where are you? Yeah. Um, in Surrey, Godalming, uh, Surrey. Uh, yeah, it's because it's an old hop growing area around here. Um, Hogs Back, which is where the brewery is, is there used to be hop fields. <laughs> so um, I think one of the things that I've heard um, is about eight times many uh, wet hops as you would Oh, really? really dry hops yeah and that does <laughs> as you point out does soak up quite a lot of the work but if you're running your work through a heat exchanger what you can do as, as it gets lower you can actually press and squeeze the hops down with something a I don't know a potato masher or something like that just to get all of the all of the work out otherwise yeah yeah you're right you do you do lose a lot of work eventually <laughs> 